Hey, how about that worship at Barry Farlett's house? Come on, that's pretty incredible, isn't it? Let's dig into God's Word together after we pray. Father, again, I just thank you. I thank you, Lord, for the privilege of being able to worship together uh, live and in person with, with Barry and with their family uh, God, I just thank you so much that we can worship together, the body of Christ, and we can see you at work among us. And Father, now we're going to continue to worship as we, as we dig into your word, as we study this incredible letter written to the church at Rome, written to us as well. Father, I pray that you just speak, because these are your words. And so our hearts and our minds are open to you and what you want to say. Create in us a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within us. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, today we're going to continue our study on the book of Romans. You know, we've been in the first chapter of Romans together. Uh, this is our ninth week. We've been doing this for nine weeks. We took a couple of weeks off. Actually, we took three weeks off. We had a snow day. Remember the snow day? Uh, so we had a snow day. That was actually right. That was the Sunday we were supposed to start this study. And then we had Easter and Ken Can filled in for me one week. So uh, we've kind of had a couple of little breaks, but we've been doing this since February. And since February, we've progressed into verse 16 of chapter one <laughs> in nine weeks. And in fact, today is our third week in verse 16, because this verse is amazing and it's powerful. It's one of the most often quoted, one of the most favorite verses of Christians throughout the history of Christianity. Paul has spent these 16 verses building this case of, for who he is and, and what he's doing. And he's writing to this church, this divided church, right? This Roman church that had been founded by Jewish Christians and started out to be very culturally Jewish, very, very Jewish Christian church. But then the emperor banned the, the Jewish people out of the city of Rome for five years. They left, and the only people re remaining were Gentiles. And so the Gentiles continued on in the church, and the church kind of lost its Jewish culture. It kind of lost its Jewish heritage over those five years. So five years later, when the Jews return, they come back to a church that's almost unrecognizable. These people are eating ham. You know, how dare they? I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't feel at all the way that it felt when they left. And so this is causing tension. It's causing division among the church. The Gentiles are saying, look, Jewish people, you were gone. What do you know? The Jewish people are saying, no, 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 no. If you're going to be a follower of Christ, Jesus was Jewish. And so you have to, you know, obey the law and the sacrifices still. And you have to still do a lot of this other stuff. You have to, you know, obey the, you have to, um, worship on the right day. You have to eat the right kind of meat. You have to stay away from certain things. You know, you, maybe you even got to consider being circumcised. And the Christian Gentiles are saying, what are you, crazy? Jesus didn't save us to be Jewish. Uh, that's the old covenant, not the new covenant. And so there's this division, this tension within the body of Christ. And Paul spends 16 verses. He's writing to them and he's, he's retuning them around the gospel. He's writing this amazing thing to reunite them around the one thing that is important, and that is the gospel message. Jesus makes them one, not their traditions, not their backgrounds, not their history, not their culture. Jesus makes them one. And so that's what he's been writing about. And then we get to this most important, most powerful statement that he makes so far in this entire writing. He says this thing that is this powerful verse that we've been studying for the last two weeks. It's so powerful, we're taking three Sundays to look at it. And here's what he says. He says, I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ, for it is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes. Yeah, we've looked at this over the last couple of weeks. Powerful statement, Paul. Wow, this thing has rung true and resounded for all of the history of Christianity. And everybody loves this verse. Everybody claims this verse. This is a, just a great, powerful verse. Not ashamed. The gospel is the power of God at work in me and in you. So Paul is building this case to unify everybody. But then, for some reason... Paul throws this phrase in to this statement. 
he throws this phrase in uh, to, to this thing that almost seems to tear it all right back down again. Yeah, he says this powerful thing about how the, the power of God is at work saving everyone who believes. That's the gospel, the power of God. And everybody said amen. Everybody would be happy with it. But then the very next statement Paul makes is a controversial one. He says, it's the power of the gospel. The good news is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes, the Jew first, and also the Gentile, he says. What? Are you, you kidding me? Come on, Paul. I mean, you've been working so hard in this letter so far to unite everybody, but now all of a sudden you're saying there's a hierarchy here? You, you, you've been trying to unite us as one in the gospel, but now all of a sudden are you saying that there's a, a top and a bottom? Paul, are you saying that there's a favorite and a not favorite? Are you saying that, are you saying that, that God loves some first? And loves others second. Uh, Paul, are you are you making me ask the question? Does God play favorites? Does God play favorites? Does God give preferential treatment? Is that even the nature of God? Does that sound like God to you? Now I know theologically we we got to think we we think no, of course not. Of course God doesn't play favorites. But let's just let's just be honest for a second. You and I both feel like. God plays favorites sometimes, right? I mean, I know my daughter's watching, and just uh, about a week ago or so, she was talking to me about how difficult her circumstances at the time were. She had gone through some tough times, and she was saying, listen, let me tell you how much God hates me. This is what's happening in my life. And what she's saying is, yeah, God gives preferential treatment, and I'm on the bottom. That's what she's kind of saying. And I'm like, hey, really? You think you're on the bottom? Have you met Barry Farlett before? Uh, you know, I mean, does God really give preferential treatment? Does God choose some over others? And the short answer is, y yeah. Yeah, God, God does choose some over others. He's always clear about that all throughout his word. In fact, God himself says so multiple times throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, it didn't start out that way, of course. That's not the way that's not the way it began. You know, it began with God creating the universe and everybody in it was to be united with God. Everybody was to be one with him, to speak on behalf of God, to be united in his kingdom. But right at the very beginning, you know, we we blew it. We broke everything. Man and woman decided that we could do better, that we knew better. And that we wanted to act on our own behalf instead of speaking on behalf of God. And so we tried to set up our own kingdom, our own kingdom in opposition to God. <laughs> well, that's treason. That's a crime against the sovereign king. And so what that does, look at what that does. It's made all of creation fall. It's made everything fall apart. And, and sin, the sin that we committed, the crimes that we committed has entered into the world. And look, now it's causing tension between people, conflict between people. Uh, it's causing uh, people to fight with one another, to war against one another, to abuse one another, to take advantage of one another. Sin causes people to not treat people like people, doesn't it? Yeah, in fact, you only have to get to the very second generation of creation and you have the very first murder. Adam and Eve's kids. That's where you find murder happening. It all came crashing down and it got worse and worse and worse. I mean, just everybody was treating everybody ugly. You, you know what that's like, right? I mean, I was talking about it just this week on our COVID coffee. You know, I go to the Walmart and, and I, all I got to do is be driving in the lane right by the door and the pedestrians that have to walk in or out of the building, they don't even look and acknowledge my existence. They just start meandering across the lane. <laughs> now, I know pedestrians always have the right of way. I will always give pedestrians the right of way. But look, I'm a human being behind a steering wheel, dude. You can at least turn your head and acknowledge my existence there instead of just walking out in front of my truck. You, you can at least treat me like I'm a person right there, right? I mean, I, I try to wave and smile when I, someone's got to wait on me to get across the road, and I try to hurry, but nope, not people at Walmart. They got to just walk as slow as they can. Man is inhumane to man. I know that's silly. I know that's ridiculous. But look at our culture. Look at our world. Look at how 
slavery happened and is happening around the world. Look at how war happened and is happening around the world. Look at how sex trafficking happened and is happening around the world. Look at how greedy people are taking advantage of poor people. Look at how we allow the homeless to continue to be a major problem and we aren't reaching out. Man is inhumane to man and that's the way it's been since sin entered the world. Yeah, that's what it means to be spiritually dead. It means that you can't see people around you through God's eyes. You can't see them the way he sees them. So human beings recognized this, and there was this great experiment, right? This great experiment that they tried out way early on. Uh, it had been several generations, quite a few generations. Mankind had kind of grown in the world, and they knew that as bad as things were, they could look around and see it was bad. They knew they needed to get back to God. I'm not sure if they needed to get back to God or if they wanted to rise up above and become God. But either way, they knew they needed to get above the circumstances. So there was this great Babylon experiment where they tried to build this tower to the heavens, this tower to God. And they tried to rise above and get above all of the stuff. And you know, God saw that. And it wasn't them bowing humbly and worshiping God. It was them arrogantly, defiantly, trying to reach God on their own terms. And so God did not put up with it and he scattered everybody, right? And things only got worse. War and, and problems like that just continued to grow and grow as people had conflict with each other. Sin continuing to bear its fruit in this world. The great Babylon experiment failed. And more generations, more and more generations go by and nobody knows God. Nobody talks about God. Nobody acknowledges God's existence. And God is silent for generations. God doesn't speak and nobody seems to notice. Nobody seems to care. Then suddenly, out of nowhere it seems, God begins again to speak. But it's not like God sent out a newsletter or flashed a bright light in the sky and made an announcement for everybody to hear. Verily, verily, I saith unto thee, I am the one true God. You shall all worship me. No, it's not like that. <laughs> Generations of silence go by. And finally, when God speaks, he speaks privately to one man. He, he talks individually to one person. He, he, he meets this person right where he is and says, hey, I, I, I want to talk to you. And he begins to make promises to this person, right? Here's what he says to Abraham. He says, leave your native country and your relatives and your father's family and go to the land I will show you and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. He says, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. He begins to make promises to this one guy, this Abram, Abraham. And so this one guy knows God. Nobody else knows God. Nobody else even notices about God, but Abraham knows God. And God promises this guy that he's going to work in him, work through him, be a blessing to him and through him in the world. Why does this guy deserve to be chosen by God? As far as we can tell, Abram didn't know God, didn't care about God. In fact, as far as we can tell, Abram was part of the uh, part of the people from the Ur of the of the Chaldees. He was a moon worshiper. As far as we can tell, he knew nothing about God. But yet, for some reason, God chose Abram. And it turns out that over the successive generations, God had made promises, and God chose to work in, speak to, and bless Abram's family, no matter where they traveled. He blessed him. They traveled to the promised land, Canaan, and God blessed him. And then they disobeyed and traveled down to Egypt, and God blessed him. And then they cheated and lied, and God blessed him. And then they went back to Canaan, and God blessed him. And God continued to make promises, and he continued to reveal himself to them and nobody else. Yeah, everybody else was just kind of left out. Bottom line is this. God had a family. God had a family. He picked one family out of all of the earth, all of the peoples of the earth. God had a family. 
And it was to this family that God continued to make promises and to reveal himself. Yeah, he kind of went silent again for a while because that family went back down to Egypt during a famine later on and they ended up getting stuck there. They became slaves there. And they served as slaves in painful situations for generations. And it wasn't for a long time that the God kind of began to speak again. And he said, okay, let's, let's restart this. Let's start over again. And let's make a new covenant together. And he began to make more promises. And he promised them that they would be free, that they would have a land of their own, that God would set them up above all the other nations. He would choose them out even more than all the other nations. And that he would be one with them, that they could worship him uh, right there in their holy land. And that God would bless the entire world through them. This special chosen family would even one day rule in paradise with God when he sets his kingdom up on earth once and for all. Yeah, they had an incredible, incredible set of promises that God made them. In fact, God's family had an incredible inheritance, an incredible inheritance. They had this special relationship with God where they had this covenant that they were promised so much from the king. And their inheritance was the king's inheritance. I mean, don't you want to have an inheritance from king? I mean, their inheritance isn't going to be like my kids' inheritance. My, my kids are probably, I'm probably going to kick off, and then my kids are probably going to owe money just because I'm not there anymore. But they had an incredible, incredible inheritance. So what does that mean for someone like me, a Gentile, someone who's not that chosen family, the Jewish family? What does that mean for someone like me? It means I'm on the outs. It, it means I'm up the creek. It means I've got no hope whatsoever. Yeah, I'm, I'm just left out of the inheritance and I'm doomed to continue to strive with other people, to fight with other people, to have sickness and ultimately death. And because I'm a treasonous criminal against God, I'm destined for an eternal separation from him, eternal death. What that means in biblical language is an eternal existence in pain and agony and suffering, all because I'm not part of the family and I'm a criminal against a holy God. This is why Paul is so excited about the gospel, because the gospel tells us that I don't know why God did it this way, but because of his great love and mercy and grace, God chose to love this criminal just like he loved his own family. God sent his own son to pay the price for my sins. Jesus died for me on the cross. And so now because of what Jesus has done for this Gentile criminal, now he calls me his child. He says that I get to be part of the family of the king and I now can lay claim to an inheritance from the king just like his family. Isn't that amazing? That is an amazing truth. Paul thinks of Abram like an olive tree. You know, a domesticated, cultivated olive tree. A beautiful tree that God has worked and worked and worked to make it exactly uh, the tree he wants. It bears the desirable fruit that he wants, right? And Paul describes me a little bit differently. Uh, he's talking about Gentiles, and he says that you Gentiles, who were branches from not the domesticated, not the cultivated tree, but you Gentiles were branches from a wild olive tree. He says you have been now, because of Jesus, grafted in. So now you also receive the blessing that God has promised Abraham and his children, sharing in the rich nourishment from the root of God's special olive tree. You see, we were part of a different family. We were part of a different tree. We didn't belong in that cultivated tree. We're ugly. We're rough around the edges. We don't grow in the right directions, and we don't bear the right fruit. 
but God freely chose to give me his son, Jesus, so that you and I could become part of his family, so that you and I could have a claim to his inheritance. And because of Jesus, now I'm a part, now I'm a co-heir along with Christ. Isn't that great? I know, I know, I know. It makes you just want to jump up and down and scream, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, but it shouldn't make you do that. In fact, Paul says, don't let that make you proud. He says, you must not brag about being grafted in to replace the branches that were broken off. You're just a branch, not the root. Yeah, he's saying you're not the branch. You're, you're, you're the branch. You're not the root. That salvation has come to you, but it's come to you through the Jews. Jesus was the culmination of the promises that he made to his chosen family. And now Jesus and Jesus alone opens the door so that you and I can be grafted in. What he's saying is this, that I didn't belong, but I was included. I didn't belong, but I was included. I didn't belong to his family. I don't deserve any of the inheritance, but because of Jesus, I am now included because of this one Jewish man who opened the door for me to be grafted in. I am now a co-heir with Christ. So what this means for me, according to Paul, is it, this should make me ask the question, who in the heck am I? Who in the heck am I? I mean, this should humble me. This should drive me to my knees. I deserve none of the blessings of God. I, I deserve none of the promises of God. I deserve none of the inheritance of God. Heck, my response should be only grateful humility because I don't deserve his blessings. Shoot, uh, as a criminal against the king, I deserve to just be a face on the busted magazine in the convenience store of heaven. Yeah, that's all I deserve. Uh, but God has chosen to give me his love and his mercy and his grace, right? And so it ought to engender in me something new. It ought to engender me fruit like that cultivated olive tree. Instead of being wild, instead of being who I think I ought to be, it ought to make me want to graft in and bear fruit like the cultivated tree. Here's how Paul tells us about it in Colossians 3. He says, since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourself. Clothe yourself. In other words, bear the fruit that he wants you to bear. Put this on. He says, clothe yourselves with tenderhearted mercy, with kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. It says, above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you're called to live in peace and always be thankful. Let the message about Christ and all of its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other on your Zoom call this week with all the wisdom that he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. He goes on and he says, and whatever you do, Whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about that for just a second. In whatever you do or say, you are now a fruit-bearing representative of Jesus Christ, giving thanks to him through God the Father. Yeah, is that us? Is that who we are? Is that, is that what being grafted in has engendered in you? Because I read some of your Facebook posts. Yeah, I'm getting better about being on Facebook. And I know, I know in our social media mindset, with our nation as divided as it is, I know we love to jump on there and we love to talk about others. And we use snark and sarcasm and we just sling our venom. We put on there what we want because we're part of that failed Babylonian experiment. We try to rise up above everybody else and pontificate and give what we think we know. And we tell everybody our version of the truth. 
And let me just tell you, you are a light spreader, not a venom spreader. You, whatever you do, are to do or say it as a representative of Christ Jesus. He made the door open so you could be grafted in. How dare you? How dare you be snarky and ugly? How dare you clothe yourself with anything but humility and grace and love? Who the heck am I? I've been grafted in. I deserve punishment, but he's given me his love and his grace and his mercy and his light. I think that's what Paul is trying to tell us, Gentiles. Who do you think you are? That's what he's saying in this passage. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God working in everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Gentile. I think he's telling us Gentiles, you're right. God doesn't save you to become Jewish. <laughs> he saves you to be grafted in. He saves you by his love and his grace. Be humble about it. Live your life as if you could see his light. And if you were responding to him, he begs us in Ephesians to live a life that measures up. He says, therefore, I, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called by God. This means that I don't fly off the handle when I'm angry. This means that I don't demand my rights. It means that I uh, handle my sex life. It means that I handle my watching TV life. It means that I handle my words in a way that honors him and glorifies him because he makes me everything that I am. It makes me want to live up to all the promises that I now get to inherit instead of living down to my failed Babylon experiment. In other words, He's calling us to live our inheritance now. Yeah, that's what God wants for you. That's what Paul wants for you. That's what I want for you. That's what I want for me is I want to be able to live that inheritance now. I want to live in the peace that passes all understanding. Don't you? Let's pray about that together. Heavenly Father, thank you that we get to experience the promises that you made all the way back to Abraham, that we get in on that even original covenant because of the grace given to us by Jesus. Lord, let us live it. Let us stop acting like we're still part of the failed Babylon experiment. And Lord, let us live our inheritance now. Let us follow you and walk in you in grace and love and humility, loving our neighbor in every way that we possibly can as you make us more and more yours. Hey, maybe you're listening now and you've never surrendered your life to Christ. I'd love to give you the opportunity right now to just give your life to him, to surrender your life to him, to turn from your old life and to turn to him for this new life and claim your inheritance. You can, you can start a relationship with him right now by praying a simple prayer of repentance and faith. It's a simple prayer that you can just pray with me and some friends of mine that I've asked to help me lead us in this repentance and faith prayer. Would you pray it with us? It goes like this. Dear Heavenly Father. Dear Heavenly Father. Dear Heavenly Father. I realize I'm a sinner. I've broken your heart by breaking your law, but I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die in my place. As best as I know how, I give up. I surrender. I surrender. I surrender. I am turning my life over to you. I don't want to live my old life anymore. I want to follow you. I know I need to change. But I don't know how. I need you to come into my life. Change me. Make me new. From this day forward, I'm yours. I am yours. I'm yours. I'm yours. I'm never going back. And I know I will never be the same. Amen. 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 That's sweet, isn't it? 
I hope you prayed that prayer along with us just now and gave your life to Christ. If you did that, we'd love to know about it. So now it's your chance to respond. And we always have a response time at the end of our services. And it's a time for us to respond. And I'd like for everybody, even if you prayed the prayer, even if you didn't pray that prayer, I'd love for everybody to take the moment to respond. Our response cards, our digital response cards, are posted in the comments right here on our Facebook feed. And I would love for you, if you're watching via Facebook, to just respond to us. Let us know how we did this morning. Let us know if you made a decision to turn your life over to Christ so we can be praying for you this week. I promise we won't show up at your house and, and play songs on your front porch. I promise we won't do that. Um, but we will pray for you and encourage you any way that we can. Our people also respond by singing. We are going to sing together again in just a minute. And they respond by giving. Giving is such an important part of being a follower of Christ. It's one of the ways that we say, yeah, I actually trust you. You told me to do this. I'm going to take this hard step of giving. And so we give. And, you know, it's easy to give in a basket, throw a, a buck or two in there when it comes by. But we don't do baskets right now. So the way you can give is you can just get on our website at theorchard.life slash give. And you can set up a one-time or a recurring uh, giving opportunity for yourself. That's the way we give in my family. We do it that way and we have been for a long time now. We love automating it because it's great to automate what's important so you don't miss it. So we like that also. We've also recently begun having text to give at our church. So you can, in fact, we were getting this set up right before the <laughs> shutdown happened, but you can do this. It's really easy. You can text the word give to the number on your screen and you can give that way as well. It's really simple to do. You set it up once and then it's just really, really easy from then on. When you give at the Orchard Church, you are helping the gospel ministry continue to move forward. You're helping us make the gospel relevant to our community. One of the little ways that we've done that just this week is that our church, multiple times now, has been able to provide lunches to our first responders in our community. So we brought Shane's uh, to the firefighters at the firehouses this week and made sure that they had lunch uh, at a time when they are being called upon a lot uh, to give. So I, I would really encourage you to give as part of that. And we've we're not done. We've done that multiple times, and we've got more stuff that we're going to be doing with our firefighters. It's just a small way we can love our neighbor and make the gospel relevant in our community. So let's continue to worship together by, by giving and by singing together. <laughs> 